you listen to the critics, if you listen to your own doubts and call them reasons, you may never find the drive to go back to school. But a little change in direction, a new perspective, and the right program may make your successful new path a reality. The Accelerated Degree Program at Albright College. Start your degree or complete your degree one night a week in as little as two years. Albright College, a different way of thinking. Good evening, and welcome to the Albright Scholar for July 2017. My name is John Pankratz. I teach history at Albright, and each month it's my privilege to welcome BCTV viewers and residents of Greater Reading to take a glimpse inside our learning community up here on North 13th Street, to look at the work being done by teachers and students, and to think a bit about its impact on all of us. Well, last month we talked about uh, theater and some summer research that was going on. And we're going to continue with that theme of Albright Creative Research Experiences. And this time we're going to look at the discipline of chemistry. Chemistry is a, a, a great field of study at Albright. We have a very strong faculty. We have some very, very gifted students and have a great record of uh, placing people in grad school and in medical school as well. Uh, so I think we're in for a treat tonight. Uh, my guests are all first-time visitors to the Albright uh, Scholar. Uh, Dr. Nicholas Pirro is an assistant professor of, of uh, chemistry and biochemistry at Albright. Uh, Zoe Gaiman is a rising junior uh, chemistry major. Uh, and James Allen is a, a rising senior uh, in chemistry as well. Welcome to all three of you. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. Yeah. Great. Nick, you're, uh, you're in your first, you're just finished your first year as a, a faculty member at uh, Albright. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your attraction to this ACRE program, this uh, mentoring of student researchers? Yeah, the ACRE program's been really great. Uh, mm. It's my first summer doing it, and yeah. I have a great summer so far with James and Zoe here. Uh, but it's really a great opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with the students and really intensive research experience that they wouldn't be able to get during the school year. Yeah. Uh, James worked with me all year, but really I think we've accomplished more in these six weeks than we did in the previous 16 or however long he's been with me so far. So it's really an experience. It's a great introduction to graduate school if you're going to go mm -hmm. on and do something mm -hmm. like that and really see what it's like to dive uh, headfirst into a research project and carry on. Right, and you've, you've been an active researcher throughout your career. Right? Yes, and so this is just another way to sort of uh, train the new students coming up and really uh, bring to them sort of the love that I have of being in the lab and being able to do that, so, uh, yeah. Great. Well, Zoe, you're, you're spending your summer vacation uh, 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 being a chemist. Uh, uh, why do that rather than go off to uh, the beach or, or, or something? Um, well, for me, like the next step after Albright would be grad school. Okay. And so obviously grad school in chemistry involves a lot of lab work. And this was my first time ever doing a research project. Mm -hmm. So it was really different being in the lab and not having someone constantly over your shoulder telling you exactly what to so do. So different from a class. Exactly. Okay. So it was just, you know, the different experience to get me a little bit more used to like, what it, will it be like if I decide to go forth mm -hmm. with this in the future and decide to pursue that. Yeah. Okay. So it's going to clarify your own professional and vocational intellectual interests. Mm -hmm. Great. James, what about you? What, uh, what's your attraction to the acre? I know you did one uh, a half acre during uh, the January term. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so really the same kind of thing that Zoe said, just I plan on going to graduate school after college. Mm -hmm. So it's really a good experience to, be able to get that hands-on research experience that you don't really get in the lab. In the lab that is associated with our classroom learning, um, that's really the kind of like a cookie cutter type laboratory setting where okay. you follow a procedure, you do this, 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 and this, and you always get pretty much the desired result. Um, this kind of research is definitely more um, open-minded and it definitely doesn't really have a, it has a direction, but it doesn't really have that exact step-by-step -step procedure. It's not a pre predetermined like, conclusion. Exactly. You're exactly. actually it's, discovering something. It's real research is what we're doing in, yeah. in a sense. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, let me have each of you tell, uh, uh, tell me the title of, uh, of your research and then begin, we'll the, begin the process of translating this for our viewers at home. Uh, Zoe, what are, what are you working on? 
Um, so well, basically my project deals with asymmetric ligands. So I create um, a ligand, which is an organic molecule, that I then bind to two different metals because the two arms of my ligand are very different, so they can support two very different metals. Mm -hmm. And then we are going to later be tracking the reactivity of them. Now, my project is much less far along than James, <laughs> so I'm still working on a lot of mine, but he's much further along in his Right. Project. We were talking earlier, and uh, I gathered that a lot of work in chemistry these days is getting metals, which are pretty pl plentiful elements on Earth, to do things that they didn't yet know they wanted to do <laughs> uh, by trying to attach these sort of hooks, these chemical uh, um, molecules that will react or, or foster a reaction with, with the metals and create uh, these complexes. Something Sounds like very that. well put together. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we take metal centers which have a lot of reactivity uh, mm -hmm. surrounding them, but if mm -hmm. you just throw them into solution by themselves, they do lots of things that you wouldn't want them to happen. Okay. So we sort of, like you said, put handles on them that can grab the metals and sort of direct them in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of like a chaperone for a little small child that has lots of energy and wants to go do stuff, but you yeah. need to lead them in the right direction. And then create uh, these substances that can be really very useful. Yeah, very useful. Uh, nature is sort of the best place to look at the powerful power of metals and what they can do, and they're very important in human biology. Mm -hmm. uh, what carries around oxygen in your blood is an iron center. Right. That same iron atom you put in a different environment, and it starts eating up drugs and metabolizing them so that they don't do detrimental things, or maybe they do. Mm -hmm. and so the same metal in two different environments that are between... Uh, the iron enzymes that decompose drugs and the ones that carry around blood look very, very similar, but even small changes yeah. create very drastic differences. In and chemistry is the science of small changes. So, yes, very those small changes. Structural can be giant differences. Pieces. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. James, what's, what's the title of your work? So the full title of my work is Novel Chelating Ligands and the Complexes They Form with Late Transition Metal Ions. Mm -hmm. So basically, what we do is we create a ligand, like again, another organic molecule, and we introduce a metal center. Um, and then that changes, again, the reactivity of the complex. So it's basically the same principle as it's always doing, it's just a different set of metal ions and it's a different set of ligands. <clears throat> so do you, do you end up uh, sharing your results or looking over each other shoulder or, or talking about how the work's going? Is it a reinforcing kind of? Not quite, we're kind of, we're both kind of on our different paths. Okay. Um, both of our metals have quite a different amount of reactivity in their uh, have a qu different level of sensitivity to oxygen or water or such. So Zoe spends a lot of her time working under the hood on the bench, mm -hmm. um, and while I spend a lot of my time working in the glove box because my complexes are very reactive with oxygen and water. Okay. So we're, we're on very different paths and we have very different uh, molecules that we're synthesizing. Um, in different spaces within the lab. Yes, exactly. Um, but they all share the same general idea of a metal center and a ligand mm -hmm. bonding site. So. Right. <clears throat> so Zoe's project isn't quite as far along yet because she very bravely dove in and chose this new project. So it's a lot of ligand synthesis uh, for now. But I think what's great about having a rising senior and a rising junior is that mm -hmm. James has been very helpful in helping Zoe out. Some of the techniques they use are very similar. Uh, and hopefully someday Zoe will train the next person coming through. Uh, right. so no, that's been a uh, privilege. I've, I've been following Acres, and I know a number of good chemistry students, yeah. and it's, it's fun to see how these um, particular projects get passed on and then just the example of uh, lab skills and, mm -hmm. and thinking about these issues and communicating about them as well. Yeah, yeah so there are some great role models uh, <laughs> that have preceded you and that I think will succeed you as, um, as, as well. Um, did both of you come, uh, I, I should uh, dig back into a little biography here uh, as well. You're both from the Berks County uh, area uh, in general. James, you went to Twin Valley? Yeah, I was born and raised in Elverson, Pennsylvania, and then I went to Twin Valley for high school and then came here thereafter. So. Yeah. And was the path to chemistry a direct one or more cir circuitous? Well, I came into college anticipating that I would want to study um, medicine, so mm -hmm. I came in as a biology pre-med student. Um, however, I quickly realized that I wasn't really a huge fan of the biology side. If you talk to anyone who studies science at all, you realize that there is a very different, there's a huge contrast between the biology people and the chemistry people. So I definitely quickly realized that I was more of a chemistry person. <laughs> um, so soon in the school, I switched from a biology degree um, 
a biology course or to a biochemistry course. Mm -hmm. And I, I dropped the pre-med track, so now I'm, I'm focused on going to graduate school. Yeah. So. And that research really suits your temperament or suits your interests? Definitely. I really, I honestly, I did not know that I would like inorganic chemistry coming in. Um, that we never, there are so few t TV shows about inorganic yeah. <laughs> chemistry, really. So inorganic chemistry is anything really to do with metals. So um, I, I didn't, hadn't studied inorganic chemistry yet coming into this project. So I didn't really know anything about it. And I didn't know if I liked it, disliked it, the, the, the kind of thing. So I realized relatively quickly that I did like the research and I liked where it was going. And I definitely feel like this is somewhere I would want to go. Um, into grad school. Um, I definitely want to go into chemistry in grad school, um, but really more specifically I think I want to try and study how these inorganic ligands um, work um, within the body in different settings. Okay. So like enzymatically for example. So it's not totally unrelated to uh, medical or therapeutic questions, but you're looking at the yeah, basic there chemistry there are, of these Yeah, there are linkage, linkages um, in a sense um, between these ligands and certain enzymatic um, processes in the body for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> And so, Zoe, you're from the Exeter? Yeah, I went to Exeter Township Senior High School. Mm -hmm. um, for me, coming to college, like, I knew I wanted to study chemistry. And then from there... Did you have good teachers in high school? I then? did. My AP chemistry teacher at Exeter was definitely someone that, like, that made a big impact on, like, this is definitely what I want to do. I remember we took a field trip to the GSK facility. <laughs> uh -huh. And I was like, this is, I could do this. I could be here. And that for me was like when I decided like, okay, chemistry in college. Yeah. And then from there, I've added two more majors <laughs> since being at college. Well, and what are those? Um, I'm also a physics major and a mathematics major. Wow, wow. And that's simply because your intellectual interests are, are trending in those directions or? Yeah. Are I, you thinking of teaching at all or? No. Not either, <laughs> no. Yeah, no, I wasn't, that's definitely something that's come to mind. Like, what am I gonna do with it? <laughs> I could be a teacher, but for me, that's not really right. an and, interest of mine. But uh, in some ways, chemistry is mathematics at, at, at some point. Yes, and like James said, with like the bi people are either biology people or chemistry people. Mm -hmm. For me, like it was definitely chemistry because it that has like the math side of it, and I'm very numbers oriented. Right. So that was like chemistry, physics, math, whereas biology was never even <laughs> in my view. Yeah. Well, there's a whole field of chemistry, computational chemistry, in which you're basically dealing with probabilities of energy exchange, and, and, and you're actually never actually touching reactive substances at, uh, at all. But you guys are a little bit more hands-on in, in these things. When, when you create a new complex, uh, how stable are these? Are, uh, when you're dealing with something that hasn't existed before, does it last a long time, or is it... Uh, uh, ephemeral. We try to touch on both sides of the spectrum. So mm -hmm. we make things that you can crystallize and put in a bottle uh, the last weeks and days and years if you keep them out of air and water. So they're okay. sense reactive to those are the kind of projects that we're working on now. But we also want to make molecules that don't last very long because those are the ones that have the most reactivity and the potential oh. to carry out really interesting transformations. Transformation. Uh, so we're working on things that you make, it lasts a very short amount of time, does a reaction, and then moves on. Uh, yeah. So if you want to study these, you have to work at very low temperatures. Uh, and so we're actually taking a trip to Penn later this week to see if we can observe some of these things at really low T. Oh, so very good. It's one of the great things about being in this area. We have a lot of collaborations that we can get access to instrumentation that we don't have right here at Albright, though we do have plenty of great stuff. Yeah, we so. have, uh, for, for an undergraduate institution, it's, it's really one of, uh, at age 20, 21, you can work with some, some pretty cool instrumentation. and Yeah. And, uh, and there are no grad students around to yeah, tell you not hog to. Hog the machines. <laughs> to hog the machines, exactly. And you, and you have a Penn connection as well, right? You did a yeah. postdoc there? Yeah, I spent about a year at Penn uh, mm -hmm. and then some time at Villanova. And so that's where we go down to actually get the structures of these compounds. Okay. Um, this thing I'm playing with is actually determined from the solid state structure that we determined at Villanova. It's sort of our workhorse molecule in the lab right now. Okay. Uh, so uh, yeah, since it's there, uh, uh, tell so, us a little bit so about So each this. ball represents an atom. <laughs> Uh, and the colors represent the different element types. And so the mm -hmm. one in the center is our metal. That's the copper ion, and that's sort of where all the business happens. Okay. And then the gray and the blue and the white are the ligand, and they sort of hold the metal in place, determine its geometry, and sort of dictate its reactivity. Yeah. So. And, 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 and what, what's the name f for the ligands then? We call this ligand TBO2-pyridine, because these fragments are TBO, mm -hmm. triazobicyclooctane. 
Uh, and then that's a pyridine in the backbone. So, okay. Uh, and where do we get pyridine? Is that is that a petroleum de derivative? Most of these organics are at some level pure uh, petroleum derived uh, mm -hmm. from different distillates. Yeah. Uh, so, yep. But, so it's a great fidget toy on my desk too. That's perfect. It's yeah. for, it doesn't spin or make noise, but that's, that's well, okay it too. Spins. Oh, it, it does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Well, that's right. It has little axis there. Yes. Twofold. Everything's all. Um, so, uh, but there's a, a number of ways to to look at these uh, molecules, right? And different ways to mm -hmm. test and observe what what you're producing. Yes. And are, are you doing the whole what spectrum of uh, Spectrum is a good word. Yeah. Uh, we are. Uh, I can let Zoe and James tell you about their favorite techniques. Well, mainly the, the biggest technique that we use, I would say, single-handedly, is what's called NMR, or nuclear magnetic resonance. Mm -hmm. So it basically works kind of in the same way that an MRI does. Mm -hmm. um, but what it does is it detects the spin on certain atoms and then reads their magnetic fields. And you can use this data. It's, it spits out a, a spectrum that has a different peaks on it. Peaks. Yep. And you can use these spectrum to really determine what kind of um, molecules you have mm -hmm. and like the relative purity of what you have also. So it's a very helpful tool to gain like a quick insight on the, what you really, what you have after a reaction occurs, you isolate it and then you get NMR. And you, you can use that to identify, well, this is this molecule or this definitely isn't this molecule. So it's a really helpful tool to like take another step forward in the further analysis. Yeah. And, you, and you can spot that at a glance, right? You, I mean, Dr. Piero can spot it at okay. a glance. <laughs> okay. and Zoe and I have a few more minutes of, of analyzing, but um, once you get good with it, it really it is a very quick and helpful tool to identify molecules and, and compounds. Great, and we've, got, and we've got the instrumentation to do that. We actually have two of these instruments. Um, a lot of schools don't even have um, NMRs, or undergrad schools, I should say a lot, but it's, we're very fortunate to be able to have two of these NMR machines here at Albright um, at such a small um, undergraduate school, and it's very, very helpful to have them there. Great, so. <clears throat> Great. Zoe, do you have a favorite? Um, well, since my project's still kind of in the beginning rounds, mm -hmm. I do a lot of NMR to make sure that um, the, my ligand is basically coming along the way I want it to, especially since I'm in the beginning stages, sometimes my reactions don't quite go as planned. Right. And so that's when the NMR steps in. Usually you look at the NMR, you say, oh, okay, this is good, and you move on. But that's when you look at the NMR and you're like, okay, so what's happening here? And then yeah. we have and to- And you see all of like, a sudden yeah. peaks exactly. where there shouldn't be yeah, exactly. Exactly. what's yep. here in my sample. And that's when you have to like break it down and say, okay, should we change what we're doing or should we try to separate things, that kind of thing. And is that exciting to you when, when you get an unexpected result and you're saying, uh-oh, uh, is that a good uh-oh? It's definitely interesting <laughs> of like, how did this happen, especially when we're following instructions that are given in the literature and it doesn't quite work out the way it was planned. It's definitely an interesting experience to then sit there and be like, okay, so what actually happened? But do you doubt yourself or do you doubt the literature? I usually <laughs> doubt myself. <laughs> but That's Dr. Piro usually... The literature is not always right, is something yeah. like mm. and, uh, So a healthy dose of skepticism is good in science. Uh, right. yeah. And the, then, then what are the other um, uh, ways of analyzing these? Uh, probably second on our list would be ultraviolet visible spectroscopy, which essentially gives you a very detailed look at the color of your compound. So yeah. it tells you where it absorbs visible light. And so we see the colors we see are because light is reflected, and so the opposite of that is the light that's absorbed. Mm -hmm. And so a UV vis spectrometer will tell you which colors exactly in the spectrum of the rainbow uh, are absorbed by your compound. And that can be very diagnostic for metal compounds that are very often colored. So blood is red mm -hmm. uh, to the iron center in there, for example. And chlorophyll is green because of mm -hmm. the magnesium center. And so the metals are very interesting in terms of the colors. So. Uh, and then we have a couple other techniques. Infrared mm -hmm. spectroscopy tells you about vibrations, so how molecules shake oh, and move. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and any other ones that we use a lot, guys? Uh, GCMS. GCMS, so mass. You can tell how much mm -hmm. your compound weighs. Okay. Uh, when these things weigh super tiny amounts, so sort of inconceivably small, uh, but we can detect exactly how much they weigh by using tricks of physics. Okay. Uh, magnetic fields. And have you guys done Raman spectroscopy yet? No, we really don't focus that much on Raman spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. um, that's more of, the way, there's actually another Acre project going on. Right. And it, I'm assuming that's where you, you came up with that. <laughs> um, but Will Adams, he's working on an, an, a combination of Raman spectrometry 
and infrared spectrometry, and he's trying to combine those and, and create a lab out of that. But we, we don't really use Raman that much at this <laughs> at this point, no. Okay. Raman's like another way to get information on these vibrations, just using right, different right. rules, different physics rules, but yeah. same Different type. kind of light thrown at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Great. So good. Um, so, so grad school is in both of your futures. Um, uh, Nick, you uh, were an undergrad at Cal Caltech mm -hmm. and then uh, went to MIT, the yes. other coast, yes. uh, <laughs> uh, for, for grad school. Um, what what should uh, you know an outstanding college student be looking for in grad uh, programs in, in chemistry? Really a good fit is a big thing. I mm -hmm. mean, find a project that you like. When you go to grad school, you're thrown into a single project, maybe two uh, for five to six years. And so you really need to know that you love what you're doing. Because uh, if the acre seems intensive, grad school is going to be infinitely more so. Uh, it's not 10 weeks. It's 250 weeks. <laughs> and it's not 40 hours a week. It's 60 to 80 hours a week. Uh, and so you really just need to love the project that you're doing and love the science. And then find a good group that fits you because uh, it's collaborative like we're three people of graduate lab can be 10 or 15 uh, or 40 if you go to some of the really big schools but I wouldn't advise it <laughs> and in some ways that's the way that uh, grad programs in chemistry are organized it's not that you mm -hmm. take a, a course with every member of a department in, right. in fact you attach yourself to a particular member or two in a department right. who have a group yeah, so you take with its own website and its own exactly. uh, patents and yeah. uh, its own. Uh, so you take coursework for a couple of years with people who entered with you, mm -hmm. mostly in your division, so inorganic, for example, and then the next three years or four years are spent just with your fifteen people or so working on related projects. Uh, so yeah, it's very intensive, but yeah, it's well worth it if you like what you're doing. And uh, it's potentially well worth it to the rest of society as well yes, as, as so. you're making discoveries that are uh, applicable and usable and yeah. maybe maybe profitable even. Yeah. yeah. Well, so. Good. And might improve human health and yeah. and happiness too. Yeah. We hope so. Good. Good. Uh, so an acre every summer, do you think? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Until I need a break, but uh, it's definitely a rewarding experience and. Uh, one of the great funds of chemistry is seeing new science and doing it and training students to do it and watching them succeed and fail because it happens uh -huh. Uh -huh. and mm -hmm. it's good practice as well. So. And, and you guys will, rec uh, Zoe, you have another summer to uh, apply for an acre, uh, but James, you'd, you'd recommend this to uh, your fellow SAE members? Yeah, absolutely. I'd recommend it to anyone who's interested in science at all. Um, this is really, like I said, great experience for grad school or even just to test the waters and see if that's something you'd like to do. Um, it definitely, I've learned a lot more, I would say, in, in just one summer acre than I have in a, an extensive amount of coursework through mm. through the school, the curriculum. So, <clears throat> okay, just because of that focus. And yeah, intensity. yeah, expect, because you're you're doing things that you don't normally do in lab like through the curriculum so you're doing a variety of different kinds of techniques and like filtration techniques and just a lot of different things that you really don't get to do um, in lab. <clears throat> Great. Well, I'm, I'm delighted that it's going so well. I know in October there's going to be a, a series of presentations by all the Acre students so uh, members of the public could come into campus and certainly welcome. Yeah. get experience credit and, uh, <laughs> and find out what we've all learned. Well, thank you, all, th all three of you, for being thank you uh, for having with me us. on the show. Well, thank you very much. Yep. Thank you for tuning in as well. Uh, we'll see you again in the month of August for another edition of the Albright Scholar. If you listen to the critics, if you listen to your own doubts and call them reasons, you may never find the drive to go back to school. But a little change in direction, a new perspective, and the right program may make your successful new path a reality. The Accelerated Degree Program at Albright College. Start your degree or complete your degree one night a week in as little as two years. Albright College. A different way of thinking.